Hi, I'm Ken Burns. Welcome to the fourth annual Better Angels Student History Film Festival, and a very big congratulations to the six student winners, our Next Generation Angels Award winners, whose films will be screened here in just a few minutes, followed by interviews. The theme of last year's National History Day documentary competition was debate and diplomacy in history, successes, failures, consequences. What are debate and diplomacy, if not discourse? The ability to talk about what we disagree on. Civility seems terribly lacking in our country today. We can barely speak to one another if we disagree. By its very definition, we think of discourse as civil, a glue that holds us together as a society. But throughout our history, as explored through many excellent student films, we see that our aspiration towards civil discourse often disintegrates into confusing, divisive, and pointless arguments. This is where history's stories come in. The novelist Richard Powers has written in his wonderful book, The Overstory, that no argument, however good, can change someone's mind. Only stories can do that. Interestingly, three of our six winning films deal with issues related to nature, something we urgently need to talk about now. These include wonderful films about returning wolves to the wild and the role of whale hunting in the culture of the Macaw people. A third explores the debate over the value of wilderness, in particular waterways in the Wilderness Act. Debate and diplomacy are not, as these young filmmakers remind us, just about war and treaties. They are about how we see ourselves as a people and how we create and challenge public policy. The films reminded me, as well, that the best history illuminates the past but speaks to the present. We suffer from the conceit of the living that suggests our challenges are unique. But issues like international humanitarian efforts, access to housing, and agricultural policy, three topics covered in the other winning films, remind us that our predecessors struggled with some of the issues we are dealing with today. I've long admired National History Day, and I love the idea that more and more extraordinary young people use film to engage with our past and tell its stories. They give me hope for our future. I'd like to thank the Better Angel Society and our partners, the Library of Congress, the Philadelphia Film Society, and National History Day for each playing a vital role in bringing these award-winning films to thousands of students all over America. I encourage you to visit our site, KenBurnsUnum.com, to explore clips from our films that touch on these issues as well. Congratulations again to the winners and all who submitted films in last year's competition. And good luck to everyone who chooses to make a film this year. Have a great festival. Thank you. Michonne, head of the Moving Image section at the Library of Congress, and your Master of Ceremonies for the fourth annual Next Generation Angels Award Student History Film Festival. Now, here's how this will work. As with any film festival, we'll screen some great documentaries, and you'll get to hear the filmmakers interviewed by me afterwards. The big difference here is that these documentaries are each only 10 minutes long and all of them were made by middle and high school students, no different than you. We'll be talking about what inspired them, how they conducted their research, how they analyzed the materials and information they found, their artistic process, and the unexpected discoveries they had. We hope you'll see that history stories told through film 
made from materials of the past, like the ones that we keep safe at the Library of Congress, are surprisingly cool and interesting, and that young people are not only capable of making them, they are phenomenal historians, filmmakers, and artists. They discovered a part of history they were curious about, and through research, analysis, hard work, and creativity, they made these films as a way to explore that history. And maybe after today, you'll even want to try and make one of your own. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So without further ado, please enjoy our first film, the third place winner in the junior division of the National History Day competition, Wolves, Bloodthirsty Menaces or Stewards of the Land, directed by Lachlan Gebhardt, sixth grade student at Lander Middle School in Lander, Wyoming. Yellowstone National Park is a land of mystery and legend. When people think of Yellowstone, they most often think of its famous geysers and hot springs, its magical mud pots, painted waters, and of course, its range of wildlife. Of all the animals that call Yellowstone their home, one species' existence stands out as more controversial than any other, the wolf. The year was 1906. The United States Congress was starting to receive hundreds of letters from concerned ranchers who made their living raising livestock near Yellowstone Park in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Their concerns all involved wolves harassing and killing their livestock, and the economic impact it was having on their livelihood. Soon, the concerns grew in the area not only to livestock, but the idea that wolves could kill more desirable species like elk and bison. The government concluded they needed to send federally funded trappers into the national park to exterminate the wolves in order to protect other animals. From this decision, the question of wolves' place in the Yellowstone ecosystem has become a huge debate. Should they have even been killed in the first place? Some say they could not have known better with very little research about biodiversity. Others argue that they should have taken more time in researching the park, rather than just choosing their bias. There have been no wolf-related human deaths in the last hundred years. However, 80 wolf-human interaction attacks have been reported in the last 60 years. Of these 80 cases, only 25 were unprovoked. Even then, only 13 resulted in injury. The rest of the 80 cases were almost exclusively wolves acting through self-defense. From 1919 through 1926, 136 wolves were killed by government trappers alone. When the 1940s rolled around, hardly any wolf sightings were reported. And by the 1970s, after an intensive study, biologists confirmed that no wolves lived inside the park. Without that major apex predator, hunting opportunities almost tripled around the park when the elk population exploded. Additionally, an increase in other major herbivores allowed for much easier animal sighting for tourists visiting Yellowstone. But the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began to debate whether profits and tourism were more important than the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In 1987, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposed that wolves be reintroduced to Yellowstone as an experimental species. We also had the Endangered Species Act come about as law in 1973 that says we cannot wipe some species off the face of the planet. And wolves are very much under that umbrella too. So the best answer as to why wolves were restored to Yellowstone is it makes it a natural system. It was the law, but finally people wanted it. From 1994 to 1995, wolves were taken out of Jasper National Park in Alberta, Canada. The biologists capturing the wolves made sure that the wolves being taken were in family groups that primarily fed on elk and bison, the primary food source in Yellowstone. The first wolves were a group of eight captured and penned on January 12, 1995. By the end of January, a total of 31 wolves were gathered and made ready for the move. From March 21st through the 31st of 1995, all of the wolves were released into different sections of the park. Later in April of 1996, an additional 17 wolves were released. The last group of 17 were not penned prior to release, like the others had been. This proved to be a problem because their intense homing instinct made them hightail it north without a second thought. Fortunately, the wolves that were penned stayed in the park. 
From 1996 to 2000, the Wolf Reintroduction Project was running smoothly and being supported by Wyoming courts. Those still debating the benefits of the reintroduction by filing court cases against were being shut down. However, in January of 2000, it was discovered that wolf reintroduction violated a section of the Endangered Species Act of 1972, which states, an experimental population that has been authorized for release is wholly separate geographically from non-experimental populations of the same species. Because nearby wolves in Montana had no geological barrier to stop them from going into Yellowstone, this violated the idea that newly released wolves were separated from native wolves. This court case brought the reintroduction project to a halt, stating the researchers could no longer study the wolves and their impact on the park. The Wolf Project appealed and the judge ruled the wolves should be recaptured and moved back to Canada, but specifically stated they should not be killed. The researchers with wolf reintroduction quickly pushed back by filing for gray wolves to be delisted as an endangered species, thus making the violation of the act no longer an issue. This changed the judge's ruling as he sided with the Wolf Reintroduction Project, allowing them to continue their work. This ruling led those in opposition on this debate to shift their focus once again to protecting other more desirable wildlife and livestock from the predator. However, when the gray wolf was removed from the endangered species list, Wyoming passed a law allowing people outside Yellowstone to hunt and kill wolves as they pleased, provided that they report the wolf kills to the Game and Fish Department. I listened to all the arguments on one side, on the other. As a hunter, I thought, you know, we can handle this. As long as the agreement's followed, this isn't the end of the end of the world. The reintroduction of wolves has had incredibly positive effects on Yellowstone in more ways than researchers could have ever imagined. Wolf reintroduction has directly impacted biodiversity in the park, strengthening the arguments in favor of bringing wolves back. However, it is not without controversy. One of the first effects seen across the park was a significant decrease in elk population, which dropped tremendously from 30,000 to 6,000. At first glance, this may seem really bad, but plant life in the summer and winter feeding grounds of the park can only support 7,000 total elk. Initially, the wolves killing thousands of elk supported the debate against reintroduction, because people thought they wouldn't stop, but it actually led to so many other areas of improved biodiversity across the entire park. Fewer elk brings about that ecosystem balance, that biodiversity that the Park Service seeks as natural. And that's a very important goal for the Park Service. One of the most fascinating scientific finds was how the wolves changed the behavior of Yellowstone's rivers. Researchers discovered widespread trophic cascade or an ecological process that affects an entire food web. Everyone knows the wolves killed animals, but they gave life to many others. With the wolves gone for 70 years, the elk population built up, bringing plant life to an all-time low. However, when the wolves arrived, even though they were few in numbers, they made a remarkable impact. In addition to thinning the elk herd, they actually changed the behavior of the elk. The elk started avoiding certain parts of the park, specifically the places they could be trapped, like valleys and riverbanks. With no elk eating the vegetation in these areas, it was able to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees almost quintupled in just six years. Bare mountainsides quickly became forests of aspen, willow, and cottonwood. With the increase in vegetation, especially trees, the number of birds increased. Songbirds and migratory birds returned to the region. Water animals like beavers, muskrats, ducks, fish, amphibians, and reptiles also increased their populations greatly. The wolves killed coyotes, which in turn allowed rabbits, foxes, and weasels to return to the park. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on carcasses left by wolves. Bear numbers also increased, with more berries growing on the regenerated shrubs. The wolves scared elk out of the river bottoms, allowing the Yellowstone beaver population to return. Beaver dams further slowed the rivers, creating better habitat for other water animals in and around the rivers. Some still debate whether or not the wolves actually changed the behavior of the rivers, but the impact the wolves made throughout the park made the rivers meander less, and there was less erosion. The channels narrowed, and more pools and ripple sections formed. The regenerating trees and shrubs absorbed the water, enough to bring the water table up and the rivers to the original level. So really the simplest way to look at it is all the parts of the system now are in place, and they're interacting differently and I hesitate to use a value judgment laden word, but it, it's healthier this way than we had 
certain parts of the system before that were absent. So all those things functioning together has made nature look like it used to before we started managing it. And those management intentions were, were good. We just didn't know enough about it. And so we've had this makeover in Yellowstone now. We've brought carnivores back, wolves being the most high profile, and it's changed the way Yellowstone looks. While controversial, this evolution is scientifically proven and a big part of the diplomacy that goes into allowing the wolves to remain inside the park. Whether you agree with wolf reintroduction or not, one thing is clear, their place in the greater ecosystem is critical to the overall balance in Yellowstone National Park. Lachlan, that was a wonderful documentary. I'm going to take a wild guess at being from Lander, Wyoming. You've been to Yellowstone Park? Oh, yes. I've been there since I was three, probably been there like 15 times. I remember the first time I like saw Old Faithful go out. I just remember like feeling something in me and I was like, this is an incredible place. Yeah, you're lucky to live that close to it. It is a wonderful, wonderful place. This was an incredibly interesting story. Uh, did you know much about wolf repatriation before you, you know, started this documentary? How did how did you come to this topic? Well, so I have connections in Yellowstone from being there 15 times, and we found this we found these people who would just track the wolves in the park all day long and so we started hanging around with them because wolves were pretty difficult to see in yellowstone and i started just slowly getting exposed to more and more of it and i started getting so much more fascinated in wolves and then i figured out that they weren't in the park for a while and i i just thought That'd be a great history day topic. So did you lock into this topic pretty early on or were there other ones that you were thinking about? I had a different topic in mind at first. I was trying to figure out if they had actually moved Native Americans off of the off of Yellowstone National Park's land before um, before its creation or while it was being created. But I could, I found one article on it, basically one paragraph on it, and I looked and looked and looked, but it was, I just couldn't find anything on it. And so then I just thought wolves, I love wolves and like animals, and it just clicked right there. So, so tell me a little bit about your research process. I mean, this is, this is a topic that is not without controversy, as your documentary points out. So I'm just sort of curious, where were the primary resources uh, that you uh, that you got and you used, uh, and uh, and how you decided to to structure the story? So I kind of started out by getting a basic overview of what happened, and then I started diving deeper and contacted the volunteers in Yellowstone who followed the wolves around. And they connected to me to a man named Rick McIntyre, whose interview proved to be so good. It just gave me so much more insight into what it was actually like being there, like transporting the wolves. And although unfortunately I could not use that footage because it was too windy, it was just a great interview and I used so much from it. So did you, uh, maybe, but you have, you've got a lot of footage uh, in your documentary of the wolves. Where, where did you find, cause you know, you in a documentary, obviously you gotta have images. So where did you find those images? And then how did you decide to structure this story? Did you write a script first and then match images to it or? vice versa or a little bit of both? Sorry, that's a that's a big question. Yeah, well, a lot of the interview or not interviews, um, 
a lot of the footage of the wolves that you saw, that could be found through like news websites. But I kind of matched it up with my script because I had a script. It definitely had to be tweaked a lot while while actually narrating my documentary. But I kind of brought together and compiled a ton of pictures. And then during some time at my home, I just started picking through each picture and each phrase in my documentary. Did you find that it was difficult to stay in the 10 minute time limit? Was your story bigger than that? Oh, yes. That was definitely difficult to do. There was so much there that it was almost impossible to fit everything into 10 minutes. I could have gone 30, maybe even an hour if I wanted to. So you do, I think, a a good job of trying to present a lot of different sides of the issue. I mean, you can understand why there were people who were upset that the wolves were, you know, hunted into a zero population in Yellowstone, and then people who are upset when Yellowstone is repopulated with with wolves. But how did you find, you know, as you're putting this documentary together, where you know your sentiments were were going? Oh, that's a tricky question. My grandpa or all of my grandparents, they kind of lived through that time period. So they were definitely more on the side of um, wolves should not be there. And they were taken out for a reason. And so I got insight into that. And then I live in Wyoming. So there are plenty of ranchers I know, especially up in the around, around the Cody area. And saw it like that side of things. But then I filtered through what the people who followed the wolves said and their opinions. And it kind of balanced out evenly in the documentary. And it was just, the balance was just perfect. I found your interview with Doug Smith of the wolf, you know, re- repopulation project to be particularly interesting. How did you find him? Well, again, I have many contacts in Yellowstone. And it was actually after Rick McIntyre, he talked about Doug Smith. I mean, I had heard of Doug Smith, but I didn't realize how crucial he was in the wolf reintroduction and repopulation and keeping the wolves there. So was there anything that was like really surprising that you learned through your research? Well, I hadn't been exposed to as much of the rancher's point of view. I mean, I had heard it, but it was mainly going to the park with the um, wolf volunteers. And I realized how painful it was for them to watch like wolves come back in and threaten their livelihood in general. And that was super surprising because I would have never expected them to be this up in arms but when i like started researching that side more it was just incredible um lachlan the last question for you are wolves bloodthirsty menaces or are they stewards of the land you know (laughs) that's a great question but in my opinion they're stewards of the land because as Personally, watching like elk and wolves just in general, they're beautiful creatures. And I would never want to see elk die of disease. And then these wolves just be slowly closed into smaller spaces. And I think they really increase biodiversity. Your documentary makes a very compelling case for that. And I congratulate you for it and for your award. Lachlan, thank you so much. Thank you. Next is the second place winner in the junior division of the National History Day competition. Maka Whaling writes, a moral debate of cultural preservation directed by Aubrey Greer, eighth grade student at Chief Umtuck Middle School in Vancouver, Washington.
The cultural heart of the Macaw tribe has always been the whale. The significance that the gray whale holds in Macaw art and tradition is both profound and long-lasting. It follows through in even their tribal symbol, which depicts a thunderbird grasping a whale in its talons. For more than 2,000 years, this resource of meat, oil, and blubber has been a vital aspect of Macaw culture. For centuries, the tribe prospered along the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Washington coast, within five villages consisting of roughly 4,000 individuals. Tradition began to crumble, however, when the arrival of Europeans in the late 1700s left much of the tribe to suffer from a transferred epidemic of smallpox, influenza, and other foreign illnesses. Fatalities plummeted the Macaw populace. Generations of ancient tradition were at risk as the heavy loss loomed over the coast. In 1855, the Treaty of Nia Bay was signed, a mutual act of diplomacy that had a profound impact on the Macaw tribe as a community. It allowed the Macaw living around Juan de Fuca and Cape Flattery to keep their marine waters and their right to whale. In doing so, however, the tribe had to give up 90%, nearly 300,000 acres of their land in exchange. The covenant had devastating effects on the tribe, despite being a profound diplomatic foundation that affirmed the tribe's whaling rights in the coming decades. Around this time, and again in the early 20th century, non-native commercial whaling operations were pushing the gray whale population to the brink of extinction. By the 1920s, the macaws voluntarily suspended their historical whale hunt, acknowledging the vulnerable situation that the species was in. They had plans to resume whaling when the gray whale population had rebounded, which turned out to be 70 years later. By the 1990s, the eastern North Pacific gray whale population had greatly recuperated. All commercial whaling in America was outlawed in 1970, which, combined with effort from activists, led to a rem remarkable recovery of the species. As a result of this success, gray whales in the Eastern Pacific were removed from the list of endangered species in 1994. It was not too long after, in the fall of 1998, when the tribe came to the agreement that it was the appropriate time to resume the hunt, given federal approval. The Macaw tribe's decision sparked nationwide debate and controversy, drawing the media and many animal rights groups into the issue on both sides. One prominent group at the forefront of the opposing side was the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, a marine activist or organization that went through great lengths to prevent the macaw from following through with a successful hunt. Sea Shepherd believed that whales should not be killed under any circumstance, despite the fact that whaling had been a cultural foundation for the tribe since time immemorial. The macaw had gone 70 years and lived without killing a single whale, so the death of one at this point seemed unjustifiable in the eyes of Sea Shepherd. Other activists argued that allowing the macaw to hunt whales would prompt and encourage the reinstallation of large-scale commercial whaling. This is what made the tribe's decision a worry to many, as commercial whaling is what led to the near extinction of gray whales in the first place. Often our, our opponents will, you know, will use science or portions of the science that's out there to try to influence the government as a reason to say no mm -hmm. to, to what we're doing. And, um, you know, we've, you know, we go through those, uh, we go through those forums, we present our scientific evidence, we, you know, we're not people that are, uh, that are anti-science at all. For eight months following the federal macaw whaling authorization in 1998, macaw whalers practiced and trained for the hunt by cedar canoe, encountering persistent protesters on the reservation land, as well as many local news reporters. The first attempted hunt since roughly 1928 was conducted on May 10, 1999, just south of Cape Flattery. A swarm of protesters, including those from Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, disrupted the canoe whale team on the water, blocking any hopes of a successful hunt for the tribe. Coast Guard boats loosely followed the macaw canoe to prevent any protesting boats from exceeding the legal 500 meter radius. Another hunt was attempted five days afterwards on May 15, but it had the same unsuccessful outcome. The kill was quick, but still brutal. Three blasts from a 50 caliber rifle and several harpoon strikes taking this massive giant of the sea down 
in less than 15 minutes. It was in the early morning, May 17, 1999, when the macaw achieved their first triumphant hunt in more than 70 years. Two harpoons thrown from a whaling canoe were thrust into the whale to prevent it from diving. Following this, a 50 caliber assault rifle delivered a fatal blow to the juvenile gray whale from a nearby support boat. The tribe's decision to make a modernized alteration was to assure a more humane death for the whale's sake, to prevent suffering. However, the decision was met with extreme anger from protesters, many of whom argued that the validity of the macaw's whaling rights went away when they strayed from tradition. Shortly after the whale had been killed, a boat from the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society arrived on the scene, honking its horn in protest of the event. Groups of whale watchers on boats traveled to the reservation after the whale had been towed to land, many of them yelling in objection. The whole world's disgusted in what you've done. Must this isn't disgusting? This isn't disgusting what you're doing here? He's so proud. Look what you've done. Look what you've done. Despite this, crowds of tribal members rejoiced from the water's edge. Whaling had always been central to macaw culture, so the positive impact that this sort of cultural rebirth had on the tribe was of great significance. Following tradition, tribal ceremonies commenced and centuries-old songs were sung. The whale was carved on the beach in preparation for a multi-tribal potlatch feast to celebrate the victory, which would take place the following weekend. Fresh blubber was passed to many members of the tribe, Undeterred by the groups of protesters that had gathered along the reservation, the macaw celebrated with the joy of knowing that the significance of the hunt would provide lasting help for the tribe. It was, golly, it's really hard to, to put into words the feelings, the actual feelings, you know, having been there and, and uh, um, been present at that time. But to know that, you know, in in our lifetime that, that that's it's no longer just stories told by our elders it's it's something that's you know that's real and attainable later on the same day as the killing a candlelight vigil took place at the seattle federal building with many protesters holding signs the event was organized as a low-key memorial for the whale that the macaw killed but it quickly regressed into a series of violent messages against the tribe Racist remarks were written on several roadside protesters' signs, such as, save a whale, harpoon a macaw, and other variations of the same phrase. Death threats were sent to the tribe by anonymous phone calls. Religious leaders in Seattle urged for tolerance as the issue began to spiral. Those who oppose macaw whaling rights prioritize biodiversity and animal rights over the cultural history of the tribe. Opposition has often been racially motivated, driven by the myth that indigenous tradition is fated to be assimilated into modernity for the sake of a growing society. There was immense pressure on the federal government from animal rights groups at this time to seize the macaw's right to whale. There was a lot of fear-mongering about what the hunt meant for the possible future of commercial whaling and gray whale species. As a response to this, in June of 2000, the federal government issued an environmental assessment of the hunt which was approved in 2001. It's, it's a, can be a complicated diplomatic process because we are operating at uh, you know, not just a national level with the federal government, but an international level that involves um, a number of countries. Unfortunately, pressure on the federal government led to a ruling by the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals deciding that more environmental reviews of macaw hunts should be followed through with. The tribe's right to whale has been in limbo ever since. The attempted sustainability of such controversial tradition has held the tribe in a continuous legal battle. Debate surrounding the ethics of the macaw's whaling rights still persists today. The tribe has yet to be allowed a follow-up to their successful hunt in 1999. You know, we're not going out there to take a life. You know, we're going out there asking for the life of that whale to be presented to us. Aubrey, I have to congratulate you for taking on a subject that generates a tremendous amount of passion on both sides. Why did you choose it? 
honestly, it was really hard for me to decide, like, from the get-go um, to really go for that topic because, um, personally, it was, like, I I'm a really politically driven person, and with something that was so charged, like, from both sides of the issue with um, a lot of controversy, it was hard for me to decide to stick with that. And um, when it came down to it, I'm really glad that I decided to do this topic. So this was just one of several topics that you were, you know, kind of thinking about doing? Honestly, it was one of the first ones. I knew that I was going to do something that was close to me personally and regionally also, like in Washington State. Um, but I just thought it would be a great choice. My grandpa is actually the um, executive director of the Lower Columbia Fish Recovery Board. And so he has a lot of connections with native tribes as far as um, diplomacy about um, fishing rights. And so I knew that was something that I had some background in, knew about, and it was definitely something that I went to first. So did you have much trouble finding information about this dispute? Oh, I think that was one of my greatest issues throughout the whole project was finding coverage about it, finding information, any sort of documents, articles. I found one news station, which was King 5, that actually covered the event, the historical 1999 uh, whaling hunt. Um, they were the only ones that had any coverage of the event. And there honestly wasn't a lot of attention that had been brought to it. So I thought this would just be a great opportunity for me to um, amplify this issue and um, bring some attention to the tribe because there, there wasn't a lot out there for me to go off of. So I, I'm curious how you even found out about this dispute between the the tribe uh, and, you know, the, you know, environmentalist uh, in the first place. Well, um, my grandpa has worth, worked with um, a few Macaw tribe members, and so he had worked with them and learned about that because it, it really is something so central to their, to their culture. Um, so he'd heard that brought up a few times, and my mom as well had heard about it. So, Well, I think you did an excellent job of trying to balance the, the Macaw perspective with the anti-whaling folks. And I mean... You know, you know as as well as I I do, the whaling industry is not a popular industry, uh, and uh, they were. It, your documentary brings out how, what great pains they would go to to look at a hunt a whale hunt as a cultural activity, uh, as opposed to commercial uh, whaling. Uh, was that something that you were trying to keep in mind as you were making your documentary? It, it definitely was, and I definitely think that from beginning my project, I had a completely different perspective on the issue than when I had finished it. And after I had my interview with Chairman Green, it basically, it changed a whole lot of it for me um, as far as how I stood on the issue and being able to decipher um, the difference between that cultural hunt and the commercial whaling, which is a really corrupt industry. I thought your interview with Chairman Green was was really good uh, and a vital part of the documentary to be able to give uh, their perspective. Is he somebody that you were able to contact through your grandfather? Honestly, I was like so excited when I found out that I was able to contact him. I mean, being a really influential head of the tribe, I mean, honestly, um, my grandpa had been talking with one of his colleagues, uh, Jonathan Scordino, who is a marine mammal biologist. And he was just super psyched about me doing that project. And he had connections with uh, the tribal council. And he said, hey, if you're looking for someone to interview for this, like I could hook you up with the chairman. And I was like, oh my gosh, I honestly was not expecting that that was something that I'd be able to do at all. I thought that I would be interviewing with him with, um, expertise as a marine mammal biologist but getting an email from chairman green was like probably the most exciting thing about my project including going to state i just i leapt out of bed and then i um skipped school that day so that i could interview him for that one day who's available mm. your uh your credits uh list a lot 
of uh, sources for images. So I'm curious, uh, you said that uh, it was uh, the television station in Seattle that had the footage from the 1999 hunt. I thought you did an excellent job of excerpting that. But you had a lot of image sources. So how did you, you know, um, uh, organize all of that for the doc? Yeah, thank you. Um, as far as like um, current images go, as far as like um, present day images of tribal land, whales and that sort of thing, it was a lot more difficult. But I did find um, several photographers that had done um, extensive projects in the early to mid 1900s where I was able to use um, their work in my project. So that was definitely a resource archives and stuff from Washington State University that I was able to make use of. You have several moments of text in your documentary. Can you talk about the creative decision making that went into that? If I'm being completely honest, there was actually a technical issue that went on before I decided that um, to do that, where I had um, a palette expander and I wasn't able to speak as fluently at that point in time. And it was really frustrating um, in the beginning, but then I realized that um, providing that really impactful, powerful statement um, and multiple text parts um, would add a lot to my documentary and it ended up being a positive thing that I'm really glad I got to include. Your documentary is sympathetic to the macaw perspective. Um, was that something that emerged during the, the process of making the documentary or did your mindset change as you were making it? Well, from the beginning of my project, I'd always intended to um, highlight the tribal perspective as it was something that I was really passionate about. But um, through the process, I was able to definitely um, gain even more sympathy to the fact that um, killing a whale for um, financial gain and as a um, large scale industry <laughs> uh, is a lot different than a significant central activity that is has been important to a native tribe for centuries, honestly. Um, and so getting that perspective from all of the extensive research that I went through um, really changed my outlook on animal activism as, an, as a whole and how cultures um, intertwined in animal um, activism is something that is completely separate from um, industry, fishing, hunting, and things of that matter. Well, Aubrey, uh, you are to be commended for choosing such a difficult topic in which passions run high on both sides. But at the end of it, was this a fun project to work on? Oh, absolutely. It was totally worth it. And it was a very fun experience for me. Well, thank you so much. It was a uh, really, really uh, terrific uh, film and congratulations on your award. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Next is the first place winner in the junior division of the National History Day competition. What they taught us, how grassroots debate and diplomacy shaped the Milwaukee open housing movement directed by Kren Bleegan, eighth grade student at Kettle Moraine Middle School in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. They violated our rights and we couldn't move where we want to and we go march to hell freezes over. The result of racism can be found in the housing policies across the U.S., which led to the 200-day marches in Milwaukee. This debate and grassroots diplomacy by Milwaukee's youth in the 1960s impacted the city, state, and country. The NAACP Youth Council led the diplomatic planning and fierce debate. Their diplomatic steps included taking the issue to the streets, which can still be seen in America today. In 1963, an advertisement paid for by the Milwaukee Board of Realtors was posted in the Milwaukee Journal, stating, quote, Today, the rights and freedoms of an individual American property owner are being eroded. 
This endangers the rights and freedoms of all Americans. It is self-evident that the erosion of these freedoms will destroy the free, enterprising, individual American." End quote. This ad referred to the open housing movement, which started to take shape in the 1960s. The reasoning for this open housing movement is evident in the information released to the middle and upper class white Americans during this time. The debate began to take shape when realtors and bankers claimed in advertisements while working with white homeowners that economic downfall loomed ahead if an African American moved into their neighborhood. Some white Catholic priests in Milwaukee were against open housing as well. Father Russell Witten described open housing as not open, but forced. He and the majority of the white community saw this debate as a violation of the Constitution. The debate was freedom to choose over basic civil rights. If an individual is approached by some individual, regardless of color, race or creed, they ought to have the right to refuse if they so desire. As many white Americans didn't have the access to resources that would reveal both perspectives, they relied on realtors for information on buying and selling. These realtors would then guide them on the path that would benefit themselves. In 1866, a Civil Rights Act was passed, stating that, quote, citizens of every race and color shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and personal property. However, 100 years later, political loopholes and the moral beliefs of the white majority created racially biased housing policies, triggering housing discrimination protests in Milwaukee. Just before Christmas in 1966, a Vietnam veteran named Ronald Britton tried to rent a duplex for his family near 29th and Burleigh. The white landlord refused, saying, what would the neighbors think? The soldier's homecoming portrayed in the famous Norman Rockwell painting was a far cry to the homecoming Mr. Britton received. In need of house for his family, he turned to the NAACP Youth Council for help. This organization was a vital part of leadership within the Milwaukee Civil Rights Movement. Formed in 1947, the Youth Council embraced Father Grappi, a local priest, as their strategic ally. As it fought for justice, the NAACP Youth Council grew to be an organization embodying young people from all over Milwaukee coming together to fight for equality. Realtors made the claim that property values would drop when African Americans moved into a neighborhood. Just the opposite came true. Data shows property rates rose two or three times its appraised value when sold to African Americans. They paid too much for their housing and were forbidden to move out of the central core. A national report in 1965 affirmed that 98% of Milwaukee's black residents lived in the central core. This is a result of intentional government action the declining of mortgages, white flight, and propaganda used by realtors all played a part in the discriminatory housing crisis in Milwaukee. Intending to pressure the city's common council, the youth council picketed the houses of multiple aldermen, which fell on deaf ears. Another critical voice, Val Phillips, led the charge in the legislative portion of this movement. As the first woman and first African-American elected onto the Milwaukee common council, Phillips introduced an open housing ordinance in 1962 that would cover the majority of properties in Milwaukee. The ordinance was overthrown 18 to 1. Phillips, the sole black council member, cast the only vote in favor of fair housing. She debated this ordinance three more times in the span of five years, each time resulting in an 18 to 1 outcome. It is my firm intention to submit this ordinance for reconsideration as soon as the rules of this council will allow. Later, Bell Phillips joined forces with the Youth Council and eventually became an honorary member. On August 23, 1967, Grappi and the Youth Council announced their next diplomatic move, marching to the South Side. The Youth Council began marching on August 28, 1967. As the march made its way down the 16th Street Viaduct, also known as the Mason-Dixon Line of Milwaukee, 8,000 counter-protesters met them. In an attempt to reduce the uproar beforehand, the NAACP Youth Council informed white residents of the South Side they were marching, but the route was kept confidential. 
The peaceful protesters chanted and sang, but were met with violence, some even taking bricks to the head, many going home that night, beaten and bloodied. This did not deter them. The Youth Council met nightly, debating strategy for the next day's march. Although it is now known as the 200-day march, a timeline had not been set. Each meeting was diplomatically held. Grappi left the final decisions up to the young people. The choice of allowing young people to lead this movement offered new debate tactics and a diplomatic mindset. Are we going to die for our freedom? Yeah! The intentions of these marches were to cast discrimination in a public spotlight. And to achieve this, the Youth Council marched every night with the intention of visibility. Many Youth Council members' greatest debate, however, was within their families. After losing her mother at the age of three, Pamela Jo Sargent was raised by her grandmother, who saw firsthand the effects of violent, racist attacks in Arkansas. She, she tried to stop me from going, but I used to climb out the window and run up the... I lived on 6th and Clark, and St. Boniface was on 11th and Clark. And so I would go up to my room like I was going and do my homework and climb out the window and go up to the march. The preachings of Father Grappi used the Bible to teach concepts such as justice, nonviolent disobedience, and redemptive suffering to the council. Difficult debates came from outside their meetings, and it took diplomatic steps from the youth in order for them to arrive at the march at all. Eventually, the debate on whether to march or not was won by the youth. In the end, older generations marched alongside their children. They were protesting about the fact that they were black Americans and they were not receiving their rights as black Americans. They were not only uh, studying history, they were making history, you see. And this was doing something psychologically to every black child that participated in that demonstration. He was telling the world and he was telling himself that not everything is right in America. April 4th, 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. April 5th, 1968. Cities all over the country break out in riots. With the Youth Council's leadership, Milwaukee marched peacefully. More than 15,000 people took to the streets, making it one of the biggest memorial protests in the nation. The dark of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The 200-day marches are an example of the time it takes to create change and the diplomacy it takes to make that change. Within this movement and era, two legacies arose. The legacy of the diplomatic mission of youth marchers is seen today through the student protests of social justice issues. The legacy of housing discrimination, however, can still be seen through the segregation in Milwaukee today. Banks and realty companies were sued on the claims of redlining and discrimination. The impact that the Milwaukee NAACP Youth Council had on America is inescapable. This was the starting point for a fair housing ordinance passed in Milwaukee on December 12, 1967, four months before the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed on April 11, 1968. The legacy of the marches have never been as prominent as they are today. An activists group in Milwaukee, known as the People's Revolution, marched for 200 days straight protesting the George Floyd shooting. This protest tactic was based solely on the marches of 1967 to 68. The 200 day marches, a diplomatic and peaceful movement, are a piece in the arc of the moral universe. And this arc continues to bend towards justice today. Corinne, that was a terrific film. Thank you so much. Like uh, Lachlan and Aubrey, you live fairly close to the geographical location of your documentary. I'm curious, had you heard about the open housing movement in Milwaukee before this, or how did, how did you come to this topic? Yeah, I actually had not ever heard of the Milwaukee open housing movement until uh, two years ago, so a year before I started this project, um, when I interviewed Dr. Robert Smith from Marquette University. And he is one of the um, main, he's like the face of um, March on Milwaukee, a digital archive and civil rights um, project about the uh, 
NAACP Youth Council and their march. And so I interviewed him for my uh, documentary two years ago for National History Day. Um, and from there, I went to one of his forums about March on Milwaukee and was just encaptured by the NAACP Youth Council and the movement in Milwaukee. I mean, would you say it's important if you're going to do a documentary like this that you feel some sort of personal connection to it, that you have like personal enthusiasm for the topic? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the main things that I think is important in National History Day because it would be a whole different experience if I had to uh, stick with a project for almost a year and had no personal connection. So I... Um, I am really passionate about social justice, and um, I think it is super important just because of um, all the things that are going on today and the parallels that you can see in, from history and um, it, like especially the the March on Milwaukee. Um, so the, that um, that connection and my passion for the social justice issues was a big part of me choosing to do this project. Yeah, you certainly did an excellent job of connecting this event from the mid 1960s with things that are going on today. Uh, I'm really curious about the sources of, uh, you know, footage. You have a lot of archival footage, a lot of archival footage in your documentary. And, uh, you know, including some like really striking color footage of uh, with some pr uh, pretty uh, repulsive uh, racist imagery. Uh, in it as well. It's a very powerful uh, moment uh, in, in your doc. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, where did you find that footage? Yeah, a lot of it was from the digital archives in the UW, within UWM. They came out with a digital archive featuring uh, primary sources, um, footage, you know, all that kind of stuff from the marches themselves. And that was one of the biggest um, places that I got all of my primary sources. Um, but it also presented a little bit of a challenge for me just because I had this huge influx of uh, primary sources and information. It made it even harder uh, to you know, get down to the soul of the project because I just had all of this information. So how did you decide then to, to, to find where the soul of the project was? Did you, did you write a script, an iterative process? How did this, you know, work itself out over time? Yeah, it was something I struggled with up until uh, my final draft. I wasn't happy with my documentary for both regional and state. I knew that it was missing the, the main like soul of the piece. Um, and I think it was a lot of late nights <laughs> um, to find the what I really wanted to include. But I think how I ultimately um, found the soul of the piece, um, like you know, through research um, and through writing a script, I I stuck to um, what can make an, an emotional impact on the audience. You know, it follows a story. It's not just a bunch of facts in a line. You know. That that's not going to make the biggest impact. So I stuck to what I really, what I thought the audience um, would be the most engaged. Was there anything surprising that you found in your research that you just kind of weren't expecting to see? Yeah. So this is super specific to my topic, but uh, I was expecting um, for this these marches to be. Um, super, I don't know how to explain it, um, but these marchers to be the main source of the movement in Milwaukee. And what I found was that although these marchers and Father Grappi um, were the face of the movement, there was so many other things going on behind the scenes. You know, So there was Val Phillips who was leading the legislative portion of this, this civil rights movement. And there was uh, there were so many little jobs within this movement that I was I didn't even expect. Uh, I thought it was very impressive how you kept coming back to people like Father Grappi and Val Phillips, 
uh, as uh, you know, people who were real leaders uh, in this movement. But what I was most struck by was the sheer number of young people uh, involved in this. Uh, and that had to have some resonance with you as a documentarian. Yeah, that was my main goal for the documentary was um, I had I kind of had a choice. I could focus on uh, Father Grappi and his impact or the, the youth. And I chose to go with the youth because I thought it was the impact that they made was so powerful. And as a young person myself, it resonated so strongly um, making the documentary. So you explicitly tie the open housing movement in Milwaukee to the George Floyd protest of 2020. Uh, was that your intention when you entered into the documentary or did that just sort of evolve? Yeah, it's hard to say. I think after studying and researching the the marches on Milwaukee, it was it just came super clear to me that it was a parallel in history. Like, um, I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And that is the quote that just I could think of over and over in my head when I was uh, researching and making this documentary, um, because it's so true that these these George Floyd protests um, of 2020 were almost identical to the 200 day marches in Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, and that seems to be a theme that's running out through a lot of documentaries uh, in this program. It's very true. Uh, I also really enjoyed your numerous musical cues uh, in the doc, uh, but even uh, to the point of uh, adding in a little bit of church organ, uh, I think when you introduced Father Grappi. Uh, but I also saw that you have a, uh, a credit for the original score. So can you talk, talk a little bit about your music in your documentary? Yeah, so uh, I am very musical. Um, in addition to making documentaries. And I thought that um, in addition to, uh, you know, writing the script, I thought it would be even more personal if I uh, wrote the music for the documentary. And so I uh, sat down on this piano um, many, many nights and um, it was my way of, of attaching um, you know, some of me to that documentary and showing how I interpreted the the documentary itself and the story that I was telling. Um, yeah, and uh, making the music for it was so powerful to me just because I could interpret the, the story through music any way that I wanted um, in addition to, and to writing it down. So what was the most fun part of making this documentary? Um, I think the, I had the most fun doing this documentary, uh, when you would get to a part, um, where you, something just clicked, you know, you were, you added some footage and your, uh, your music worked and your script lined up and it was so exciting to have that moment that just, it was like, whoa, this really works. And then, you know, you would get your family to come in and watch. Um, and that was, I, those were some of my favorite parts of making this documentary. Corinne, thank you so much and congratulations on your award. Thank you. Next is the third place winner in the senior division of the National History Day competition. More Than Potatoes, Debate and Diplomacy in the Mission of the USS Jamestown directed by Jesse Henderson, 12th grade student at Bradley Central High in Cleveland, Tennessee. Welcome friend of peace and virtue, welcome to her emerald land. The Jamestown now, no ship of war, her peaceful way she wins, a mighty conquest she's achieved, and hearts of oak she bends. A victory great as e'er was won by how of Nelson's arm, an unarmed frigate low we see, God keep her from all harm. Now the land is cold and blighted. Now the crop has failed again. 
The USS Jamestown's mission to provide aid to Ireland during the Potato Famine may have failed to improve treatment of Irish Americans at the time, but lasting consequences included saving many lives, sparking ideological debates that continue, and setting a successful precedent for governmental humanitarian diplomacy. Before that time, international charity wasn't viewed as a sign of strength. It was felt that if one country was suffering, it was their own concern. That began to change in 1847. The average Irishman lived solely on the potato, but in 1846, potato crops began to show signs of Phytophthora infestans, or potato blight. This widespread infection left the already impoverished Irish without sustenance. The British government, which controlled Ireland, had mixed reactions to the famine. Queen Victoria wrote a letter to her subjects asking for donations to help the Irish, eliciting a great response. But soon, English sympathies turned against the Irish. Due to disbelief of Irish reports, civil unrest, and a struggling economy, the English failed to sufficiently meet the starving people's needs. Across the Atlantic, news of the Irish condition began to reach the United States, whose people were themselves fighting a war with Mexico and nearing a civil war. But American people and organizations of influence began to seek donations from those living in the land of plenty. Donations from as far as Native American tribes in the western United States began to pour into relief committees in cities such as New York and Boston. Then, the Honorable Robert C. Winthrop received a petition from Boston merchants asking for use of one of the Navy's warships to send donated provisions to Ireland. The idea was quickly put forth in Congress, but the country was at war. This brought up many concerns for legislators. Could it take a ship away from its present wartime duties? Would the government make a monetary donation? Who would fund and man such a voyage? What did the United States owe the people of Ireland? Was permitting such a journey even constitutional? The bill originally introduced by Kentucky Senator John Crittenden called for the Secretary of the Navy to allow two ships to be loaned to private citizens and would include a government donation of $500,000. No congressman felt they should turn against the Irish, but there was debate over enacting the unprecedented bill. Indiana Senator Edward Hannigan believed the United States owed it to the people of Ireland, who had given us a Jackson and hundreds of other names. However, Arthur Bagby from Alabama felt it was only right to help those in the United States. He wanted to know why the British weren't doing more. South Carolina and John Calhoun said he would vote for the bill, but this appropriation was a very heavy one to make when the country was in a state of war and subject to the demands upon our treasury. Maine Senator John Fairfield debated against Congress's right to give such appropriation, feeling they should reach into their own pockets to help, but not use public resources. President James K. Polk expressed sympathy for Ireland, but was against government participation in charitable efforts. As the debate continued, one area in which there was no contention was the suggestion for civilian Captain Robert Bennett Forbes, an experienced seaman and prominent member of Boston society, to lead the mission of relief. Captain Forbes encouraged support. He wrote, I dare say the idea may be considered absurd in Washington, but it is here a very popular idea. Nothing would give me more pleasure than to volunteer and go to Ireland. The press reported that the average American also supported the bill. The Abbeville Press and Banner stated, A ship of war to carry bread to the hungry and suffering, instead of powder and ball to inflict more suffering on our brethren, children of the same father, is as it should be. Some Americans were upset the government wasn't going to do more. Finally, the debate ended and the bill passed on March 3, 1847. It had failed to secure the $500,000 government donation, but succeeded in allowing two naval ships to be loaned and providing money for refit and repairs. Forbes began to arrange for all armaments, save two cannons, to be removed from the ship. He also organized a crew of inexperienced but eager volunteers. The ship's cargo was primarily loaded by Irish American and Irish immigrant volunteers. On March 28th, the USS Jamestown set sail for Cork, Ireland with 8,000 barrels of food and clothing. In just 15 days, the Jamestown reached Ireland. The Ship of Mercy was greeted by thousands of cheering Irish citizens in American tunes such as Yankee Doodle and Lucy Long. Maurice Power, Cove attorney, described the event saying, A thousand tongue, half paralyzed with hunger, uttered the feeble but still distinct exclamation, God bless America. The Cork Examiner detailed, Never did we see our beautiful harbor to such advantage as at that moment. And yet most English papers were strangely silent on the arrival of the Jamestown. Forbes said, Great unanimity of sentiment prevailed. Nearly everything of a political nature was properly omitted. However, with the Jamestown's arrival, a new and heated debate arose amongst Cork officials about how to distribute the donations. Some were of the opinion that the provisions should reach throughout the county of Cork, with none going to city residents, but others felt the life-sustaining goods should stay within the city limits. Unable to compromise, Captain Forbes was asked to provide his thoughts, knowing the committee couldn't turn down the man responsible for the donations. 
Forbes diplomatically suggested that distributing the food throughout the city and surrounding county, reaching as many people as possible, best fulfilled the intent behind the donations. While this settled the debate among Cork officials, it failed to satisfy other counties. Reverend John O'Sullivan from County Kerry lamented, I am then disappointed, deeply disappointed, while so much greater distress exists in the county of Kerry. After 10 days in Ireland, on April 22nd, the USS Jamestown sailed for home. They left behind 800 tons of cargo, but brought back with them gifts, gratitude, fond memories, and a new eternal precedent for national humanitarianism. They arrived in Cape Ann, Massachusetts to a hero's welcome on May 16, 1847. The Jamestown mission's success wasn't the end of New England's charitable efforts. Throughout 1847, 144 other ships, including another naval warship, left America with donations for Ireland. However, in the immediate aftermath, the United States' dealings toward the Irish were not always successful or honorable. Throughout the famine, Irish immigrants settled in the port cities of the U.S., especially Boston. That number increased after the Jamestown mission. They had viewed the generosity of the people as open arms. The reality was quite different. With many poor, sick, and struggling to acclimate to an industrial society, they quickly filled tenement houses, doorways, and cellars. Bostonians looked upon them with disdain. As one clergyman said, Must we submit to be overrun by the paupers of English government? They were afraid the Irish would spread cholera, plus the starving Irish were costing the city money. For these reasons, American sympathies began to wane and charitable contributions slowed. Although aid during the Great Hunger stopped, other successful diplomatic humanitarian efforts did not. Humanitarian diplomacy is defined as governmental decisions persuading for, and acting in, the interests of vulnerable people and with full respect for fundamental humanitarian principles. Because of the precedent set, the United States government has continued to help countries and people in need. In the 1920s, aid was sent to Russia during its famine. At the end of World War II, the U.S. again used vessels of war to provide support, parachuting food to former enemies in East Berlin. In more recent years, in the name of humanitarian diplomacy, the United States sent famine aid to African countries over 100 years after Congress settled the debate over the Jamestown mission. The United States Navy has also continued to use their resources to help those in need. Today, government-sanctioned humanitarian aid is not alone in its efforts. Non-governmental organizations such as the Red Cross, Compassion International, Direct Relief, and Habitat for Humanity International work tirelessly to help those in need around the globe. Such undertakings have not come without debate, however. For example, in famine-related situations, no one argues that letting people starve is a good idea. Yet many worry that humanitarian aid creates dependency, removing the ability for affected populations to support themselves. Pierre Perrin, medical doctor and humanitarian worker for the Red Cross, warned that aid can discourage those who come to rely on it over the long term from overcoming the crisis by their own means. But others stipulate that as long as efforts are made to resolve the issues that pushed them into famine, then the benefits of humanitarian diplomacy outweigh the cons. Long term, it's education, it's access to drinking water, it's nutrition. Those kinds of long game objectives are the ones that create lasting security. Without the success of the Jamestown mission and the collective altruistic actions of the American people, it is unlikely that such charitable actions would have continued in the same way. Irish-American relations, though never perfect, were improved by U.S. efforts during the potato famine. The congressional debate and decision around the USS Jamestown's mission succeeded in saving many lives and set a precedent that continues to direct diplomatic humanitarian efforts and expectations today. Reverend R.C. Watterson, Forbes' friend, summed up the Jamestown legacy as, A ship of war changed into an angel of mercy, departing on no errand of death but with the bread of life to an unfortunate and perishing people. That was a terrific documentary, Jesse. I'm really curious, how did you come to that subject? Um, so I've been interested in naval history for a few years now. Um, so I knew I wanted to do something about the Navy. Um, and then also I'd been toying with the idea of doing an Irish topic. And um, I discovered that this was the perfect blend 
of those two that also fit really well with this year's um, overall theme of debate and diplomacy. So that's kind of how I came to the decision. Did you lock into that pretty early? Yeah, I did. It was actually a really easy decision, which I didn't necessarily expect this year to be easy, but um, the decision itself was pretty easy. Great. Can you talk a little bit about your research uh, process? I mean, you know, certainly I had heard of the Irish potato famine, but I didn't know this connection with the Jamestown. I found that to be really interesting. Um, yeah, so um, it was kind of hard um, to go like directly to places since I am far away from Boston, um, but I was able to get some books from our local library that um, were about it, and I ordered a book um, that is specifically written about it, and it was published like 2020, 2021, I don't remember. Um, and so it was really a fairly recent thing. And then I got to use the resources that he used. I kind of um, stole some of the things that he did. Um, and so um, that was kind of my starting point. And then from there, it was easier to find more sources based on that. But a lot of my research was done just online, um, looking for the primary sources that had been uploaded. Now, of course, with the documentary, it's going to be very visual. So you're having to go out. I mean, you're working with a time period, you know, back in the 1840s, although you do carry that story forward from there. Was it difficult finding images that would illustrate the story that you wanted to tell? Um, it was um, pretty difficult to do that. There was a fair amount of just like um, pictures that I could broadly fit with it, but some of those weren't very high quality or um, they were just kind of hard or leaps to um, tie those in. Sometimes there weren't pictures of the people that I wanted. And so that was kind of difficult, um, but it just, I don't know, it took a lot of going through records and stuff to find those primary source pictures. And then um, so for some stuff, I would put just graphics in if I couldn't find just a primary source image to go there so so let's talk a little bit about the the structure of your documentary so you actually using the jamestown and the irish potato famine kind of as a backbone of a story of the history of humanitarian aid mm -hmm. through diplomacy so did you did you write a script bef beforehand before you started making this or i mean how, how did it kind of become come together um, so after I did, you know, my research, I would figure out like the three sections of my video. So the context and then um, kind of the main part, which was actually about the Jamestown story and the debate that surrounded it. And then the last part would be about the humanitarian efforts from there um, up to modern day. And then from there, I wrote a script um, that included what I would say, and then just the quotes and things that I would use throughout it. So that's kind of how I compiled that part. And then from there, I went through and um, with what images I had, I went ahead and paired those with sections. And then if I there was a spot that I didn't know what image to put there, we would then search specifically for that. So it sounds like there was kind of a mix of you having images and knowing what you wanted to say over those images, and then you having things to say and then trying to find images that would match yes. with mm -hmm. that. So this sounds like a really iterative process. I mean, how, how long did it take for you to put this together? Uh, I guess from the research, it took from, I don't know, I guess probably end of September to um, whenever we had to turn it in May, I guess. Um, to from like the research and then actually compiling the video probably took about a week. Um, but the script added on to that. So like with the script writing, it probably took two weeks and then. And so did you, how many times, I mean, through this process, did you have to, you know, re-edit it? Um, I, I edited a lot um, between like the regionals and the state one. Um, so that was I don't really know how many specific edits I made through those, but that was normally my process. Like I would get the finished product for each thing and then I would go through and edit after every um, competition. So what was the most challenging part of this project? And was there anything surprising that you learned? Um, I think that surprising, I'll go ahead and do that one. Um, the just 
the idea of how revolutionary um, the idea of international aid was at the time, I think was really surprising. I didn't really know that um, people didn't understand and that, you know, people in other countries are also people in help. Um, I didn't, I didn't think that that would have been the case, but it was really revolutionary. Um, and then the hardest part of the process, um, it was hard to find primary sources um, with me being limited to online because I couldn't get to Boston easily. And because of COVID, it was harder to get into archives and even get to talk to people at the archives because their staff was limited. Um, and so that was difficult. It was hard to narrow down the parts that I like all of the information into a 10 minute time frame. That's always difficult. So that was pretty difficult, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I suppose if you were going to have the director's cut of this, it would be much longer than 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, well, I mean, was it fun? Oh, yeah. I love this process. I love the research process. I love the editing process. I just like learning the tiny things that get me excited, even if they don't necessarily end up in the film at the end. Um, I like learning how to do new graphics and um, getting to put the music in. I just really love the whole process. So, Good. Well, that actually leads really well into my next question. Did you have much experience in putting together documentaries, videos, before um, you started this process? Well, I've competed in National History Day for five years doing documentaries, so I've had that much experience. <laughs> Do you find, is there a part of that uh, process that you enjoy the most? I think just, just the getting excited um, about the small things is my favorite part. The small things about the research or when I get excited because I've done something really impressive on the screen and so then I have to go get my sister and make her watch it. I like sharing that kind of stuff with people um, and just feeling the buzz and the excitement about learning new things and getting to do that. So, so you mentioned music. Where where did you get the underlying music for your documentary? I actually really enjoy Irish folk music. So I've been listening to it for years. Um, so this was an easier um, process in picking them because I knew some music that would fit with the topic. So a lot of them are songs that talk about um, the Irish um, famine, even if I use the instrumental. Um, and then of course, when I um, use Yankee Doodle, it's mentioned in the script. And so I had to include a clip of that in there, so. So did you know going into this that you were going to try to tell the story of humanitarian diplomacy, or did that just kind of emerge as you did more research on the Irish potato famine and America's response to it? That part definitely emerged. Um, pretty much nothing that I looked at put the humanitarian and the diplomacy together when talking about this specific event and interrelations with, Irish, with the Irish, but it really did a lot of diplomatic um, predecessing and um, it was just, it was very diplomatic in the way that it happened with the inclusion of how much the government was involved. There was just so much diplomacy involved. I didn't really realize that at the beginning. Um, and I don't think a lot of people put that together with this before. Yeah, I know. I just thought that you, you did a really nice job of tying this historical precedent together to things that are going on in the news today. So I thought it was just a, it was very impressive. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Jesse, for your time and congratulations on your very well-deserved reward. Thanks. Next is the second place winner in the senior division of the National History Day competition, Fight for Our Wilderness, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act, directed by Abigail Peters, 11th grade student at Roseville Area High School in Roseville, Minnesota. Formed by glaciers leaving behind cliffs, rocky shores, and over 1,000 connecting lakes and streams, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is a unique place for recreation, scientific research, and education. Along with Canada's adjacent Quetico Park, 
The Boundary Waters is the only canoe wilderness area in the world and is the most visited wilderness in the U.S., spanning over 1 million acres within the Superior National Forest in northeastern Minnesota. In the early 1900s, the local economy was almost exclusively dependent on the logging and mining industry. Environmental degradation of forests threatened the peace of the Boundary Waters, leading to the first conservation movements. In the 1970s, through a series of hearings and public debates, the issues regarding the use and management of the wilderness were fiercely debated. In the end, diplomacy prevailed with the passage of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act of 1978. Following the act, continued diplomacy has been essential to resolve local tensions and maintain the pristine quality of this wilderness for generations to come. In the 1800s, American settlers began arriving in Minnesota in great numbers following the discovery of rich iron ore deposits and a seemingly unlimited resource of pine trees. As a result, leading up to 1900, the destruction of forests and watersheds reached an all-time high. Conservationists argued for the scientific management of trees to provide sustainable profits. However, powerful lumber barons had no incentive to change their methods repeatedly lobbying against Congress to prevent conservation bills in the early 1900s. Due to efforts by the Commissioner of the Land Office of Minnesota, Christopher Andrews, the first forest reserves were established in Minnesota, and in 1909, President Theodore Roosevelt set aside 1 million acres in reserve with the creation of the Superior National Forest. Despite these diplomatic successes by conservationists, by 1925, almost all of the land that was not protected had been cut, prompting many of the major logging companies to pack up their operations and move west. In the same year, hearings were held by the International Joint Commission over a proposal to build dams throughout the Boundary Waters. After many days of debate, no decision was reached, but the publicity had promoted the conservationist platform to mainstream attention. Following the hearing, conservationist Ernest Oberholzer organized the Quetico Superior Council, the first of many conservation groups for the Boundary Waters. Through the council, Oberholzer spearheaded the Shipstead Nolan Act of 1930, the first legal protections for the purpose of wilderness to be enacted by Congress. This act prohibited the homesteading of land for sale, construction of dams, and shoreline logging. Despite this, the 1940s and 50s saw a resurgence of logging throughout the interior of the Boundary Waters alongside a growing recreational tourist industry, intensifying the debate over the diverging interests of local residents, loggers, and tourists. In 1964, in response to diplomacy by environmentalists to limit logging and motor use, the Secretary of Agriculture, Orwell Freeman, appointed the Selkie Committee to create a report on the state of the Boundary Waters ecosystem. The day after the committee was formed, the first of many public debates was held by the Quetico Superior Council, giving the attending Dr. Selke insight on the divided public opinion on use of the Boundary Waters. As the wilderness situation continued to evolve in Minnesota, nationally, a major environmental movement was developing. In 1964, after eight years of debate and over 60 drafts, the landmark Wilderness Act established the National Wilderness Preservation System, prohibiting roads, motor use, and logging. While the Boundary Waters was named a wilderness, it had major exceptions to the act, allowing logging and motor use to continue as new regulations had to come from the Secretary of Agriculture directly. Stricter regulations for the Boundary Waters wilderness were adopted by Secretary Freeman in 1965 following recommendations from the Selkie Committee, Freeman's directive sparked strong local outrage as increased restrictions were placed on logging, mining, and motorized travel, creating zones of uses. Leading into the 1970s, logging continued right alongside recreation. In 1973, the Minnesota Public Interest Research Group filed a federal lawsuit against the Forest Service over continued logging sales within the Boundary Waters without an environmental impact statement. The court ruled to suspend logging, but this was reversed in 1974, proving federal legislation through diplomacy was the only way to solve this dispute. In an attempt to find a compromise, on October 24, 1975, Minnesota Representative Jim Oberstar introduced a bill proposing to split the Boundary Waters into two parts, creating a smaller, pure wilderness area and a national recreation area that would continue to allow logging and motorized vehicles. What we're trying to do is to balance the uses. 
recognizing the different characteristics of the land and the different history of use in those areas. Environmentalists opposed this bill, supporting Representative Donald Fraser's bill introduced in June 1976. In the Fraser bill, the entire boundary waters would be given true wilderness status, ending logging, mining, and the use of all motorized vehicles. There are all kinds of lakes open for motorboat use in this area, not to mention the rest of the state. If you want a canoe-based wilderness experience, you have one place to go in the United States, and that's up here. With the two bills in direct conflict, a U.S. House Subcommittee on National Parks and Recreation ordered two field hearings in Minnesota in July 1977. The public debate over wilderness at the hearings provided key diplomacy between the conflicting groups, leading to a drafting of a third compromise bill co-sponsored by Minnesota Congressman Bruce Vento and Californian Phil Burton. The Burton-Vento bill looked to phase out motor use and end all logging in the Boundary Waters, reaching similar wilderness protections as the Fraser bill, but over a longer adjustment period. Here we said this is such an important national resource, and it's used by people from all over the country, from all over the world, uh, so we can't let the local interests override the national interests here. And so we were able to pass the bill in the House pretty much as a pure wilderness bill. The Burton-Vento bill stalled out in the Senate until mediation talks were held between Ely City Attorney Ron Walls and Environmental Attorney Chuck Dayton. The attorneys reached what is known as the Dayton-Walls Agreement, compromising to allow motorboats on certain lakes. After this agreement, the revised bill was proposed in the Senate and after hearings and a few minor revisions, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act was passed and signed into law on October 21, 1978. The final bill included an additional 50,000 acres, a new quota system for visitors, significantly restricted motorboat and snowmobile use, and banned all logging and mining within the wilderness. Despite the new act, tensions among locals over the Boundary Waters regulations remained high into the 1980s, with multiple lawsuits filed contesting the act, which was upheld and ruled constitutional in every case. By the 1990s, the public opinion had started to shift in favor of the wilderness as local residents and business owners have adapted to the change and grown to appreciate the value of the Boundary Waters as a wilderness. Since the 1978 act, the tourist industry has grown with the canoe outfitting business providing for environmentally sustainable economic growth. Lessening local tensions further was another compromise in 1998 between representatives Jim Oberstar and Bruce Vento to reopen two truck portages for transporting motorboats between lakes in exchange for more limited motor access on other lakes. Today, the Boundary Waters continues to face threats of environmental degradation, Proposed copper sulfide mines, twin metals, and polymet are located just outside of the boundary waters and upstream of the watershed. This type of mining has never been done without pollution, and the proposed locations risk contaminating the pristine waters with highly toxic acid mine drainage. Although recently the mining permits have been revoked, the boundary waters continues to be at risk requiring continued diplomacy to enact permanent legislation protecting against new mining threats. The Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act has protected this special wilderness from destructive human use, preserving untouched natural resources for generations to come. The debate between various groups of conservationists, politicians, and local residents was key in the adoption of the 1978 Boundary Waters Act, demonstrating the importance of diplomacy to resolve disputes. Today, thousands visit this wilderness every year, maintaining the local tourist economy while conserving the natural environment. The Boundary Waters demonstrates the success of American wilderness protections to secure for the American people of present and future generations the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. Abigail, that was terrific. Now, I can't help but notice a geographic connection. So was that a source of inspiration for you? 
Yeah, it definitely was. When I was choosing my topic, I was originally thinking of foreign diplomacy and thought of Canada-US border disputes or anything like that and immediately tried to connect it to my home state of Minnesota and thought of the Boundary Waters, which I have personally visited, I think, six times in the past like seven years of my life. So uh, the geographic location is definitely a big factor. I love the area and I think it's a, it's a very beautiful place and I really wanted to share that with not only viewers in Minnesota who also who had never heard about it, but also to a national audience. I, I mean, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned foreign diplomacy because, you know, when we hear that as a prompt, that's kind of where we like immediately go to. So I'm kind of curious is, you know, your process and working your way back from foreign diplomacy into something that's a little bit more local. Was it, were there a lot of different topics that you were rolling around in your head for a while? Yeah, I was definitely rolling around a lot of foreign diplomacy topics, like even looking at things as far fetched as like the Cold War, which couldn't be any farther from like environmental, very local topic that I ended up with. But in working back and really looking at what diplomacy was, I realized that it didn't just have to be between, say, the U.S. government and the Canadian government over this area in northern Minnesota, uh, but it also could be between the activists in the Twin Cities or residents of the area and just the US government, those like three groups could have their own diplomacy and had a lot of debate and diplomacy that went into this act. Yeah, and I think it's really important to remember a lot of history happens right in your own backyard. Uh, and I'm, you know, curious about the kind of uh, resources that you use. So when you started on the process of finding out more about this Wilderness Act, where did you go to to look for those resources? Pl keeping in mind, too, you're making a documentary. You're going to need images. Yeah. So uh, first, when I start my research, I usually try to start with books, but I actually struggled in the beginning with that since. A lot of the times when you look up the boundary waters or something of that sort, you find the current day problems that are facing it or also like how to visit the boundary waters. And so to actually find the history of the boundary waters, I mainly had to use archives from the Minnesota Historical Society and from other news sources like the Minnesota Public uh, Records, I believe it was, and also personal interviews. So I really had to go into the direct archives, which were a lot of that came from some of the people I interviewed who had worked on the act. They were the ones who created these archives. So I, I had to go back to the primary sources to find all of this. And for the images, the same thing. I found most of those through the Historical Society and sprinkled that in with some more current day, just beautiful, beautiful visuals of the Boundary Waters today. Well, your story has a lot of nuances to it. I mean, there were a lot of diplomatic twists and turns to this, all of these, you know, various acts uh, and different Congress folk getting uh, involved. So how did you kind of keep all of that straight as a sort of structure telling this story? Yeah, so there were a lot of perspectives, but what helped me was to kind of break it down and make it as simple as I possibly could. So I looked at what are all of the differing opinions that went into the Boundary Waters. And what I found was there's the people in the Twin Cities and around the country who visited the wilderness and appreciated it for canoeing and camping. There were people who lived around the wilderness and made their living off of resorts and like motor boating. And then there were kind of the politicians who in Minnesota, it was like the senators. So they had to both contend with the people who lived up north around the wilderness who wanted one thing and then the people in the cities who wanted the absolute opposite thing and th that's both of their constituents so i kind of had to mesh all of those together and what i found was a very nuanced debate and many different debates so it it what i found was it actually took a really long time just because of the nature of how many perspectives there were so you use a lot of uh, really good and I think informative graphics uh, in your uh, in your doc. Um, 
you know, particularly maps, I think, uh, because, you know, you're, this is a, a, a geographic story uh, as well. Were you able to uh, find that? And I mean, where, where, where were you able to find that kind of information? Yeah, a lot of the maps actually came from like news articles from back in the 1970s. So there's like the Quetico Superior newsletter and other just like Minnesota newspapers that were reporting on it. And this is where I found like, here's what the Boundary Waters like geographically looks like in 1970. And then five years later in a different newspaper, it would have changed. So I had to go back to, again, primary sources to find these visuals and they really came from a variety of different places, but were all super vital to show just how quickly it changed because in the span of one year, the map would look drastically different. And you interviewed several people for the documentary and how did you find them? And then, you know, you decided to include uh, Chuck Dayton, an environmentalist uh, actually in the documentary. So I'm curious about that choice that you made. Yeah, so first of all, how I found all of these interviews it was mostly just like cold emailing people. Most of them were part of some sort of environmental foundation, like Kevin Preshtol was part of the Wilderness Watch or Chuck Dayton was a part of another um, charity foundation. Um, and so I just reached out to them and they were more than willing to talk to me about it. And actually Chuck Dayton, that interview, he was super knowledgeable on the topic. And in that interview, I learned so much that I wouldn't have found anywhere else. He took me through kind of the intricacies of the debate and kind of the background debate. So he mentioned how they went and met at this one person's house to debate if, if their side should accept this resolution and what their next move should be. And ultimately, as I mentioned a little bit after his interview, he was the lawyer in the Dayton Walls Agreement. So he not only played a big role as an activist, but he was kind of the key uh, resolver in this conflict towards the end. And so I felt it was important to include his interview to kind of just bridge that gap between sections and then lead into um, his involvement. So were there things that were surprising to you that you found during the course of your research? Yeah, there were definitely a lot of surprising things. I'd say probably the most surprising was the length of the conflict. So not only in the 1970s, when uh, also going back to the interview, Chuck Dayton mentioned how everyone at this time, Republicans and Democrats, were all for the environment. So environmental policies were really big. So even at this time where they were passing new legislation that is still in, in effect today, left and right, it took so long for them to pass the Boundary Waters Act and actually took even longer when you look at the grand scheme of things. I mentioned, so basically the timeline of my, in, my entire documentary spans about 200 years because you can go all the way back to uh, Christopher Andrews and the first forest reserves for the Boundary Waters in the early 1800s uh, and then on to the 1970s and even beyond that for continued protection. So that length of the conflict and debate really surprised me. So what was the most fun part of making this documentary? The most fun part was probably my personal connection. I've obviously been many different times and actually a few times found uh, pictures of lakes and I'm like, I've been there, I've been in that exact place. So. I really, I, I could understand the topic to a much deeper level. And then that also helped me choose pictures and videos that I thought were most important. There's a lot of word association. Like when I talk about outfitting, I've obviously been to an outfitter multiple times, but most of my viewers won't have. So I've got to think what's the best way to display this. And so that part where I knew, I know the boundary waters very well. And so I'm able to pick pictures and videos super well. Well, you did an excellent job of finding video that makes you just want to get your kayak and head up there immediately. It looks beautiful. Thank you. Abigail, thank you so much and congratulations on your award. Thanks. Next is the first place winner in the scene vision of the National History Day competition. Communist in the cornfields, Roswell Garst Citizen Diplomacy, directed by Macy Hill, 
11th grade student at Livingston High School in Livingston, Texas. On September 23rd, 1959, history was made in the small town of Coon Rapids, Iowa. Surrounded by hundreds of National Guardsmen, reporters, and journalists from all around the country, standing in the middle of a cornfield, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev gave the world the first glimpse of hope that peace was possible between the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The ongoing Cold War had increased tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States as the threat of nuclear war was looming. Yet in the midst of the Cold War standoff between the two superpowers, Premier Khrushchev had accepted an invitation from Iowa farmer Roswell Garst to visit his family farm and to see firsthand America's successful farming methods and agricultural practices. In an act of citizen diplomacy, Roswell Garst welcomed Nikita Khrushchev to his farm and home in 1959, which sparked much debate among Americans. However, the visit between Garst and Khrushchev helped to form a mutual understanding between the Soviet Union and the United States that ultimately led to the first thaw in the Cold War. And it all began with corn. In a special White House conference, President Eisenhower reads the text of a joint announcement released simultaneously in Moscow. The President of the United States has invited Mr. Nikito Khrushchev Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR to pay an official visit to the United States in September. Mr. Khrushchev will visit Washington for two or three days and will also spend 10 days or so traveling in the United States. The two-week visit included stops in Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Des Moines, Iowa, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and finally to Camp David, where he concluded his trip with meetings with President Eisenhower. Upon accepting Eisenhower's invitation, Khrushchev made two requests, that he would be allowed to visit Disneyland and that he could travel to see his friend Roswell Garst in Tor Garst, Iowa Farm. Nikita Khrushchev's American tour swings into the world's best corn country. Nikita Khrushchev arrived at the Garst Farm in Coon Rapids, Iowa on September 23, 1959. I remember going to the farm that morning with my dad, uh, driving to the event and going through several checkpoints in Coon Rapids, one on 4th and Elm and another on 4th and Main and then another one on 5th and Main. And my dad explaining who he was over and over and lots of National Guardsmen hanging around with machine guns on the corners and looking at ID. Uh, this is in Coon Rapids, Iowa, pretty amazing. The visit prompted great debate among many of the citizens of Iowa as protesters lined the streets. The phrase, we will bury you, was ingrained in the minds of many Americans. Only a few years earlier, Khrushchev had made the remarks to a room full of diplomats at the Polish embassy in Moscow. Local farmers stopped buying Garst's products, citing they refused to support communists. The debate over Khrushchev's intentions caused divisions among Americans who were living under the constant fear of nuclear war. These anomalous circumstances led to one resounding question. How was it that the communist leader of the Soviet Union was now stomping through the cornfields of Coon Rapids, Iowa? The answer? Citizen diplomacy. After emerging as leader of the Soviet Union in 1955, Nikita Khrushchev set about on his mission of reversing the inhumane ways of his predecessor, Joseph Stalin, and immediately began his pursuit of improving agriculture technology in the Soviet Union, beginning with the introduction of corn. Khrushchev addressed the Communist Central Committee in 1955. During this speech, Khrushchev praised American farm practices in the heartland and expressed interest in learning from American farmers how the Soviet Union could increase food production through the development of feed livestock agriculture. As the Soviet Union was struggling to feed its people, America's crops and food supply was bountiful, due in part to an Iowan farmer named Roswell Garst. Garst was an innovator in agriculture. He was best known for his hybrid corn seed. Garst hybrid corn seed produced greater yields of quality corn, which was used to feed livestock, resulting in improved livestock production. Khrushchev did not view America's advancement in agricultural practices as a threat. Rather, he felt that he could use America's technology as a tool that would solve his country's food insecurity problem. 
Roswell Gar strongly believed in the idea of citizen diplomacy, the idea that private citizens can build important relationships with foreign nations when governments and diplomats fail, because unlike governments, citizens are not confined by policy and history. In 1956, President Eisenhower convened the White House Summit on Citizen Diplomacy. Eisenhower wanted the country to know that in the midst of the possibility of nuclear war, peace was every American's cause to take up. If we are going to have, take advantage of the assumption that all people want peace, then the problem is for people to get together, to leap governments, if necessary, to evade governments, to work out not one method, but thousands of methods by which people can gradually learn a little bit more of each other. The notion that citizens could make a difference and act as diplomats for their country fueled Roswell Garst's relentless pursuit for an export license that would allow him to sell his corn seed to the Soviets. This plan seemed highly unlikely because at the time, the State Department would not allow any exports from the United States to the Soviet Union. Garst believed that hungry people were dangerous people. The State Department eventually granted Garst the export license. This set a great precedent for future trade with the Soviet Union. Khrushchev's son, Sergei Khrushchev, later noted that the export license with no time limit punched the first major hole in the Iron Curtain. Days before Khrushchev's arrival to Coon Rapids, hundreds of reporters ascended upon the Iowa town. Gars was not interested in the media attention and was infuriated by the mass of reporters stumbling through his cornfields. Khrushchev not only wanted to learn about corn production, but he wanted to see how Garst's high-yield corn seed ultimately led to increased meat production. While in Iowa, Khrushchev toured the Bookie Meat Packing Plant. Here he interacted with many working-class Americans. It was the common citizens that Khrushchev was interested in learning from. My father was in the meat packing business. Khrushchev ran right over to me and kind of put his arm right by me and and the only thing i remembered about Khrushchev is that they had just gone sputnik had gone to the moon so i looked up to him and i said and i said to him i said you beat us to the moon but we make better hot dogs Khrushchev bonded with the farmers in iowa and wanted to interact with the crowds he shook hands hugged children and patted the full bellies of those he met these interactions were significant because Khrushchev felt connected and loved by the american people this was an unforeseen consequence of the groundbreaking trip. His visit did not win anyone over to communism. Khrushchev did, however, win people over with his personality and the way he related to the citizens of Iowa. In 1963, the cool and rainy spring and early summer in the Soviet Union proved disastrous for corn production and over 80% of the acreage that had been planted withered and died. Khrushchev's obsession with corn ultimately contributed to his downfall. In his later memoir, Khrushchev acknowledged his failed attempt to replicate the Iowa Corn Belt when he remarked, Corn was discredited, and so was I. Khrushchev and Garst had bonded over their obsession with corn. Their unlikely friendship had made Americans and Soviets alike see the world where they could coexist together without the threat of nuclear war. Roswell Garst was an ordinary citizen who turned a corner in history by reaching out to the premier of the Soviet Union and offering the leader the opportunity to feed his people. Acting as a citizen diplomat, Garst allowed America to gain access to Soviet markets, something politicians, including Eisenhower himself, had failed to do. Garst once remarked to Khrushchev, we two farmers could settle the problems of the world faster than diplomats. Suppose the United States had not allowed Garst the export license. Or what if Roswell Garst refused to help Khrushchev out of fear of their political differences? History could have played out much differently. Khrushchev formed personal relationships with the people he met, especially those he met in Coon Rapids, and he valued those relationships. These relationships that were forged served to strengthen the mutual understanding between the two countries. Perhaps one of the factors that deterred Khrushchev from ever pushing the nuclear button was the reality of the destruction that nuclear war would cause. Khrushchev now personally knew the country and the people who would suffer from his missile strikes. It was unthinkable that he would destroy the people whose hands he shook, whose children he hugged, and the home and farm of his friend Roswell Garst. No matter how tense relations between the United States and the Soviet Union became, 
Khrushchev now had far more to lose than he ever had before. And it all began with corn. Macy, that's a fantastic documentary. I'm really curious how you came to the topic of Nikita Khrushchev visiting Iowa. <laughs> Well, I actually frequently watch um, PBS history documentaries. It's just something I enjoy doing in my free time. Um, and one random weekend in, I believe it was June, I was watching one with my mother and it was called the Cold War Roadshow. And it was about the entire trip that Khrushchev took to the United States, not just specifically um, to Iowa. Um, I, the portion about Iowa was only actually about 10 minutes in the whole film. Um, but it really stuck out to me and intrigued me because it was just so strange that Nikita Khrushchev was walking through a cornfield in the United States in the middle of the Cold War. And I, I just had to know more. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know about him visiting Disneyland. I know about him visiting Hollywood sound stages. I had no idea that he went to Iowa. So this was a really fascinating documentary for me. And you have tons of archival footage in it. So can you talk a little bit about your research process and where you found that footage? Right. So I began my research in about the towards the end of June um, last year. And um, I basically began right after I saw the film, The Cold War Roadshow, and I just started kind of doing, you know, your random Google searches, trying to figure out what exactly happened. Um, but then I started really digging into um, the photographs I was coming across. And I came across two specific photographs that um, resonated with me. One um, was of a little boy looking up at Nikita Khrushchev, and I was like, he has to still, um, like, he has to still be alive. I, sure enough, I can, like, get him to talk to me about this. Um, and then the same thing was with um, Roswell Garth's um, granddaughter, um, a very similar photograph of her speaking with the premiere. Um, and so from there, I kind of dived into that rabbit hole, trying to figure out who these people were. Um, and so when I got in contact with Elizabeth Garst, she really referred me to a lot of resources I could utilize from um, the Iowa region because I'm all the way in Texas. It was a little difficult to find those primary sources um, that you would get from universities in Iowa and libraries and archives there. So she was really helpful in terms of that. Um, and Harry Bucky as well. I sent him a letter um, just in the mail randomly hoping that he might would answer. Um, and he did about three months later, um, and he sent, he actually gave me access to his family's, um, like, personal archive of photographs from the day that Khrushchev visited his um, father's um, meatpacking plant, so. So basically, you did some cold calls on but. people just to find this, and, but, but they responded in a positive way. It actually led you on to other things. I mean, those personal connections, I would, I would guess, are really uh, important as you're making a documentary a lot of times. Yes, very much so important. So I, you're, you determined that you were going, you wanted to interview them because you had seen them in other places? Um, I had seen them in photographs when I was doing my research as little kids. They were about eight years old at the time. Um, and I really think oral histories are so important when it comes to making films. Um, and that's why I always really um, focus on topics that lend themselves well to a film and to a documentary um, where there is good footage and there are people who can talk about it to you, you know. Um, so they were a very important part of my project for sure. So I'm, I'm really curious how you structured this. I mean, I, you know, you only had 10 minutes. And that might seem like a lot of time to tell a story. But as you well know, it definitely is not. So how did you decide to structure this and, and put some boundaries around it? Because, you know, you need to explain who Nikita Khrushchev is. You need to explain why he was in Iowa. And then, you know, and then you even you followed up a little bit at the end about kind of the results of his trip. So talk about the process that you went through to, you know, kind of boundary this. 
Well, I always begin with what I like to call a storyboard, um, where I kind of get a general script. It's almost like writing your history paper before it comes to life in the form of a documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I begin there and then I kind of go through and with the um, footage and photographs I've already collected, I go through and kind of annotate where I think those should go. Um, But this year I, with the 10 minute time limit, I found it very difficult to make sure I told the whole story because there's so much there to tell. And so I was very challenged in that aspect. Um, just having to leave out things that were so interesting and so cool. Um, like I came across this commercial about corn and it was the first commercial ever produced in the Soviet Union. And it was so unique and interesting and it couldn't go in the film because of the 10 minute time limit. Um, but yeah, and then I ended up going back and adding in a rewind effect um, into my script because I just wasn't really happy with the layout of the way I was having to tell the story. So I felt like it was best to set the stage of what was about to happen and then go all the way back before Khrushchev came into the picture. Oh, you anticipated my next question, which was about that rewind effect. (laughs) I thought that that was really, really effective. How did you decide to use that? Well, I just, I wanted to do something different. I've done documentaries for a while now, um, for about five years now. Um, and I wanted just something unique and, but also that would lend itself well to the story. Um, and so as I was compiling my script and started editing my film and my program, I realized that something just wasn't quite right with the way, um, the timeline was there. Like it was so chronological that it just felt like blatant history facts being thrown at you. Um, So I felt like that cinematic aspect that I was able to throw in um, really did um, make a huge difference artistically. You know, you say that you like watching documentaries in your spare time. Do you find that, um, you know, and having watched a lot of documentaries, you've absorbed a lot of lessons from those? (laughs) I would say yes. Um, I have found that I have a very unique style of what I like to see in a film. Um, and I've kind of made that the way I edit as well. Um, I think that flashy can only take you so far. And so I'm very interested in keeping it simple, but clean. Um, and so I feel like that has definitely transferred because that's most of what you see on PBS and the History Channel. Um, so that has definitely transferred into the way I edit as well. So do you, do you find that there's a line to walk between, you know, this like historical document that you want to make, but you also want to make it artistic as well? Yes, definitely. And I think this year, um, especially I was able to kind of find that sweet spot um, that I don't really think I had ever explored fully before. So was there any part of the research or the putting together of this documentary that surprised you? Um, I would say just the way that Khrushchev was perceived by Americans. Um, When we learn about Khrushchev in our history books in history class, we don't typically learn about this. Um, And we learn about this stone cold, you know, ruthless leader well, in America, people were excited to welcome him here and they were excited to embrace his visit. And he enjoyed meeting the American people. And that was a unique side of this story that I didn't really expect to come across. So what was the most fun part of doing this documentary? Um, well, besides the just when something clicks, especially like that rewind effect, I worked on that for so long. And whenever I was able to run into my mom's room at like two in the morning and tell her, look what I did. Um, I think getting to compete in person at Texas History Day this year was um, a big highlight for me. Um, I just love getting to tell the story to people face to face and to judges Um And that was something I haven't got to do in so long. So I really enjoyed that. Well, Macy, congratulations on your award. It's a a really fantastic documentary and appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Well, that concludes our film festival. If you want to view these films again, see the award winners from previous years, 
learn more about how to make your own documentary, or explore the fantastic educational materials that the Philadelphia Film Society created to accompany these films, go to the Better Angel Society, all one word, dot org, backslash N-G-A-A. I'd love to give a special thanks to the Philadelphia Film Society for hosting the fourth annual Student History Film Festival, to the Better Angels Society and National History Day for making this award possible, to the Library of Congress and Ken Burns for their important work in creating and promoting American history documentaries, and a huge thank you to all of you for watching these great films. Last but certainly not least, congratulations to Lachlan Gephardt, Aubrey Greer, Kren Bleegan, Jesse Henderson, Abigail Peters, and Macy Hill for making these exceptional documentaries. Thank you to the Library of Congress for their archives and resources. To Ken Burns for inspiring us to make great history documentaries. To the Better Angels Society for recognizing us with this awesome award. To National History Day for supporting our projects. And of course, thank you to Mike Michon for being a great host. host.